Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final installment of Voting Matters, the capstone conference of Schlesinger Library's long 19th Amendment project, generously funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I'm Jane Kamensky, the director of the Schlesinger Library, and my, uh, I and my many colleagues involved in the long 19th Amendment project have worked over the last four years to support new scholarship that sets the American women's vote in a long temporal and a broad geographic arc, as well as within a richly intersectional analytic frame. The Voting Matters series has showcased the diverse kinds of work that we've sought to catalyze and to amplify over the course of this project. All of the conference's sessions have centered on historical moments leading up to and during the century in which the 19th Amendment removed national impediments to women's voting. Those moments, 1848, 1870, 1920, 1965, and 1982, have led us finally to today and 2020, uh, our attempt to make a first pass on the history of gender and American citizenship during the present momentous turning point. What just happened? And how did the legacies of the 19th Amendment help to shape the recent election, its run-up, and its fallout? This is the core question before our dazzling panel of experts who speak to us from the vantage point of their work in diverse fields, regions, and political ideologies. I'll introduce them each to you all too briefly in the order in which they're speaking so we can get the conversation started. Each panelist will speak briefly, uh, sort of telescopically, distilling a single big idea that she wants to put on the table for our consideration. Then our moderator will facilitate a conversation with each of them and with the audience. And just a reminder that you can use uh, the Q&A feature at any point during the program uh, to direct a question for later discussion. Our first speaker is Professor Mei Nye, Lung Family Professor of Asian American Studies and Professor of History at Columbia University. Nye is the author of many books on the history of immigration and American citizenship, perhaps most notably Impossible Subjects, Illegal Aliens, and the Making of Modern America. Among her current projects is a brief history of the idea of the United States as a nation of immigrants. Nye is also a Radcliffe Institute alumna, fellowship class of 2004. Speaking second is Karen Lips, the founder and president of the Network of Enlightened Women, an organization founded by young conservative women with chapter, chapters on many college campuses. Its mission is to educate, equip, and empower women to be principled leaders in a free society. Lips is a graduate of the University of Virginia and of UVA Law School, and was a spring 2016 resident fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Institute of Politics. So we welcome her back virtually to Cambridge. Lips will hand the virtual microphone to Professor Moon Duchin, another Radcliffe Institute alumna, class of 2019 uh, and a Harvard alumna before that. A leading expert on electoral maps, Duchin is associate professor of mathematics at Tufts, where she is a geometer and also directs the science, technology, and society program and runs a research lab on metric geometry and gerrymandering. Duchin will be followed by Olivia Perez Cubas, a political strategist who serves as communications director at Winning for Women and the WFW Super PAC Action Fund, which is the first of its kind dedicated solely to electing Republican women. Envisioned as a kind of counterpart or counterweight to Emily's list, Winning for Women argues that, quote, more opportunity for women makes a stronger country. Paris Cubas comes to us fresh from W for W's stunning success in the 2020 election, whose results will bring the highest number of Republican women to Congress in American history. Also fresh off a notable victory in organizing is our final speaker, Nse Ufot, executive director of the Nonpartisan New Georgia Project, a nonprofit organization 
whose mission centers on voter engagement and especially on youth voter engagement. Leveraging technology to drive new levels of voter engagement and participation in Georgia, UFAT is hailed as one of the civic renewal leaders who quote, makes voting fun, all the cool kids are doing it as the Georgia results showed. Our incredibly uh, skilled moderator for this wonderful panel is Leah wright Rigur, formerly my colleague at uh, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and now the Harry S. Truman Professor of American History at Brandeis. Uh, she is a frequent uh, television and radio commentator, as well as an author on Black Republicanism and many other topics. With gratitude toward you all and great excitement about learning from each of you, it's my pleasure now to pass the virtual floor to May Nye. Thank you, Jane, and to the Radcliffe Institute for inviting me to speak today on this final panel of this conference on citizenship, voting, and sex. And congratulations, too, for sponsoring such a successful series. One of the big takeaways from the series is that we cannot understand gender and voting without also accounting for race and class. This is clear in the 2020 election. Overall, women voted for Biden, 57% to 45%. But 55% of white women supported Trump compared to 90% of black women and 59% of Latinx women who voted for Biden. Class is also salient. Biden won decisively among households earning less than $99,000 and $50,000 a year whereas Trump won 54% of those earning more than $100,000 a year. If we think about the history of the franchise and the legacies of both the 15th and 19th amendments, it becomes clear that while movements for inclusion are always battles against regimes of exclusion, inclusions themselves also create or are predicated upon other exclusions. Thus, the 15th amendment gave black men the vote, but not women. And the 19th amendment gave women the vote but by 1920, Black people had been effectively disfranchised by Jim Crow. On our panel in the 1920s, our moderator asked us how we might rewrite the 19th Amendment if we could. I suggested that we strike the word citizen. That's not a freak idea. It was a policy in some states in the 19th and early 20th century to allow immigrants to vote under certain conditions. That practice fell away, though, in part because it was relatively easy for immigrants to naturalize, excepting Asians who were barred from naturalized citizenship until 1952. In fact, naturalization rates among the foreign born generally remain low throughout the 20th century, suggesting that many immigrants were unconvinced that voting would make a material difference in their lives. It's striking to note when there were periodic spikes in naturalization. In the late 1920s, after Congress passed restrictive quota laws and only citizens could immigrate a family uh, from abroad. After the 1996 Welfare Reform Act cut legal immigrants from social benefits. And under the Trump administration, there was again an increase in the number of naturalizations. There was a gendered aspect to this history. The reasons for naturalization that I just noted mostly pertain to the family. Family unification, family well being family separation. Today, nearly half of the foreign-born population are naturalized citizens. And interestingly, since 2009, more than half of those naturalizing each year are women, 55% in 2018. More research needs to be done to determine why that is. It could simply index the general feminization of immigration, or there could be other reasons. Certainly, nativism and racism were central themes of the Trump administration, both in policy and in crafting his popular base of support among certain sectors of the population. But the main issue of the 2020 election was not immigration or the economy or the pandemic, nor was it a referendum on socialism, the new calling card of conservatives, though actually it's an old bit. The main issue of the 2020 election, as it has turned out, is whether the vote itself even matters. For a full month now since the election, we have been witnessing a grotesque spectacle, an attempt by the incumbent president to overturn the results of this election on utterly baseless grounds that there was widespread fraud and machine rigging in so-called Democrat cities, which is an undisguised attack on black voters. Although all of Trump's efforts to overturn the results have failed, 
polling results, uh, polling reports show that 50% of Republicans think Trump won the election and upwards of 80% are not sure he didn't win. Local election workers are now facing threats of violence. For months, the president and the Republican Party have worked to set up conditions that would throw the election into chaos in the event of a Democratic victory. That was the purpose of all the specious allegations that mail-in voting resulted in fraud, the slowing of the mail deliveries, et cetera, et cetera. It was a calculated and deliberate strategy to delegitimize and undermine Biden's presidency. As a historian, I must point out that the anti-democratic trend predates Donald Trump by decades. It has its origins in Richard Nixon's Southern strategy, which was to woo white Southern Democrats to the Republican Party by making the Republican Party the anti-civil rights party. And in subsequent decades, systematic efforts of voter suppression through gerrymandering, massive purging of voter rolls and the like. Or one could say it reaches back to the election of 1876 and the Hayes-Tilden compromise that ended Reconstruction and ushered in nearly a century of Jim Crow and the disfranchisement of black voters. Of course, it has not been a straight line from 1876 to 2020. But the situation today, in my view, is far more grave and consequential than a swing of the pendulum. What is happening now in the United States is a page from the authoritarian playbook that we see around the world in which elections do take place, but they are rigged or subverted to keep a minority party in power. Authoritarianism needs a personality cult leader, but it also needs the collusion of a party that controls other levers of governance. The Republican agenda, cut taxes for the rich, deregulate business, roll back civil rights, etc., is unpopular among broad swaths of the population. Therefore, the Republican strat uh, strategic priority is to hollow out democratic institutions, to obstruct legislation in the Congress, and to pack the courts so that, failing obstruction of legislation, the courts can overturn laws the Republicans don't like. The Senate and the federal courts, the two least democratic institutions of governance, want to make sure that voting doesn't matter. That profound undermining of democracy, along with the slavish devotion to Trump, fear actually of its base, and hence also toleration, if not endorsement, of right-wing violence, white supremacy, and the like, that is why I believe the Republican Party has become an authoritarian party. Even though Trump lost the election, the authoritarian threat to democracy remains. Since November 3rd, Republicans have made it clear that they intend to change state voting laws in order to curtail or eliminate mail-in voting, early voting, and otherwise further restrict access to the franchise. I'd like to conclude by respectfully addressing a question to our two panelists today who represent conservative and Republican organizations. I would like to know what is your vision of the Republican Party as it pertains to the sanctity of the vote? And specifically, I would like to ask you who won the 2020 election, Joe Biden or Donald Trump? I think these are fair questions to ask at the conclusion of a conference called Voting Matters 2020 Vision. Thank you. And it is now my pleasure to pass the virtual floor to Karen Lips. Thank you for including me on this panel. While the COVID-19 pandemic has dominated the headlines this year, we must not forget to celebrate 2020 as a historic year for American women. Let's put those partisan preferences aside for a moment and consider together the milestones that we are all witnessing. Senator Harris is poised to become the first woman to serve as vice president. More women than ever will serve in the new Congress thanks in part to the double digit increase in newly elected Republican women in the House of Representatives. Justice Amy Coney Barrett became the fifth woman to serve on the US Supreme Court and is the first mother of school-aged children to do so. It is fitting for these milestones to occur in 2020, the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Now let's take a moment and consider the life some of our grandmothers were born into in 1920 and appreciate the world we live in today. The la average life expectancy for an American girl born in 1920 was just 57 years. The median age of marriage for women was 21 years old and women were far less likely to attend college than men. 
earning just 34% of bachelor's degrees and 15% of doctor's degrees. In 1920, women made up just 20% of the labor force. Compare those numbers to today. The life expectancy for a girl born in America in 2018 is 81 years old. The median age of first marriage in 2019 was 28. In 2020, women are projected to earn 57% of bachelor's degrees and 54% of doctor's degrees. And women make up 40%, 46% of the labor force in the United States. In short, we have a lot to be grateful for. American women today overall have opportunities that most of our grandmothers could only have dreamed of. We owe these opportunities in part to the feminists who broke down barriers. After all, women didn't always have the right to vote, own property, or access to credit. The question we must now answer is how can we carry forward their legacy by further expanding opportunity for girls and women in America and in around the world? The answer is by advancing a new version of feminism, opportunity feminism, that seeks to maximize freedom and opportunity for women so women can build the fulfilling and meaningful lives as they see fit. The key is that they have the chance to build those lives as they see fit, not designed in one way. We need to reframe the feminist movement and how it defines success. While feminism today primarily focuses on issues that divide women, there are plenty of issues that we can come together on to help advance all women under the banner of opportunity feminism. Even in 2020, after all the progress we've made, there are still barriers to equal opportunity that need to be torn down. Take education, for example. Every girl should have the opportunity to learn. Around the world, many girls do not have the basic opportunity to go to school. An estimated 130 million school-age girls are out of school. Even in the US, girls from low-income households have fewer opportunities in K through 12 education, in, in part because their only real option is to attend a school assigned based on their zip code. The lack of opportunity has real consequences. According to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, in 2019, 57% of American 12th grade girls scored below proficient levels in reading. Our current system isn't working. We must advocate for education uh, reform to make sure all girls have access to a quality education. And girls shouldn't just have the chance to get an education, they should have the choice when it comes to who they marry. Around the world, 20% of women aged 20 to 24 years old were married before age 18. In the United States, only four states completely ban marrying children under 18. The majority do not. In February 2017, a study by Unchained at Last estimated that over 248,000 children had been married in the United States between 2000 and 2010, mostly girls married off to adult men. Alarmingly, the immigration system even encourages child marriage. A bipartisan investigation led by Senator Ron Johnson, chairman of the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, found that during the past 11 years, US Citizenship and Immigration Services granted more than 8,600 immigration petitions for spousal or fiance entry involving a minor. In 149 approved petitions involving an adult spouse or fiance and a minor, the adult was older than 40. Also, girls should be safe from female genital mutilation. The practice of removing the external genitalia of girls and young women without a medical purpose. According to UNICEF, 200 million girls and women alive today living in 31 countries are the victims of FGM. The CDC has warned more than 500,000 women and girls in the US were at risk or had suffered FGM in 2012. Women should come together to strengthen federal efforts to prevent women and girls in America and around the world from being subjugated to this practice. A tragedy of modern feminism is that the women's movement has been captured by a narrow American domestic policy and politics. For decades in the US, women's issues have been defined by the lens of partisan politics. Debates about women's rights have been viewed through the lens of right versus left. 
rather than focusing on areas of agreement like these barriers to equal opportunity, where I believe the vast majority of us agree. Debates about the future of feminism have pitted us against each other. It is yet another example of the zero sum left versus right nature of American politics today. As a result of the current American political culture, many women don't even feel like they will have a chance to have their voices heard. In 2018, the Network of Enlightened Women, known as NEW, the group that I run, published our first book, She's Conservative, Stories of Trials and Triumphs on America's College Campuses. This book shares the stories of 22 young women on what it is like to be a conservative on campus. One key takeaway from the stories is that many of them had decided to silence their conservative views before they had even stepped foot on campus. Not just because they were worried about the grades, but because they were worried about their social lives as well. Instead of telling women what is acceptable to think, a truly empowering women's movement would celebrate women who disagree about policy in a civil manner. To truly make progress for women, American women should join together in support of a new wave of feminism, opportunity feminism, that focuses on freedom and opportunity for all. Thank you. I'm now pleased to turn the floor over to Moon Duchin. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so it's, it's a real pleasure to join you today and to be part of this panel. And actually the, the remarks that I wanna make um, pick up on two themes that were referenced and introduced by the speakers we've heard from already. Um, so May Nye asked us about how systems make voting matter and maybe how they make voting matter more or less. We think of systems like the, the US Senate and the Electoral College as working differently from other systems um, such as the, the House of Representatives. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, and we also heard uh, at least a reference from, from Karen Lips about the newly composed Supreme Court, uh, which has of course changed quite a bit in the last few years. So I, I'd like to talk about a, a, a theme that brings those together. And that is, um, you know, looking back to 1965 and forward from 2020, um, I, I wanna think a little bit about the Voting Rights Act its legacy and its future. Um, and so we've got this incredibly powerful law in the books from, from 1965, dealing with um, important conditions of the time, but that, that law has had a really long, rich and interesting um, afterlife and continued life to the present. Um, and it was transformed a great deal in the 1980s as we heard in an earlier installment in this conference sequence when um, in particular um, spatial voting blocks were written into the law around the VRA enforcement. So spatiality matters when it comes to voting. So this is what I work on. I work on um, redistricting, gerrymandering and other um, voting system mechanisms for thinking about how, um, how intentions become representation. So let's take a very quick look at some of that spatiality in the context in which the VRA was, was enacted in the 1960s. So here's an image of, of Mississippi. Um, and you see this in the Northwest, this Delta region of the, of the state, which was traditionally um, heavily African-American. Um, prior to the mid 60s redistricting, you, you had a, a district that pretty much cut that Delta region and kept it intact. But then in a bid to prevent black enfranchisement from being converted um, more directly to black political power, um, Mississippi legislators redistricted, cutting that uh, Delta region into thirds so that in none of those districts could there be a black majority and therefore black electoral opportunity. So this is part of what I think about is how districts and spatiality are part of that picture of the conversion of voters intent of voting into, into outcomes, into representation. Okay, that was then, and the VRA has been a, an extraordinarily effective tool to combat this kind of um, uh, device that blocks opportunity to elect candidates of choice. So when it comes to space, um, place, race, and representation, um, the way I would summarize this is that you have spatial clustering such as the African-American um, enclave in, in the Delta region in Mississippi, uh, that gives you the opportunity to gerrymander or to sort of slice 
um, the, the polity in a way that dilutes the vote. Um, but it also enables the building of careful plans that provide more opportunity than a neutral alternative that's block blind. So this is something that's, that's highlighted in my work um, and, um, and that I wanted to bring out as a theme, which is when we're blind to the kinds of representation that occur, districted systems, which are how we do a great deal of voting in the US um, then and now, it's really kind of baked into the way Americans think about political representation, but blind districting actually is very punishing to, um, to numerical minorities of all kinds, be they racial, be they gender minorities, be um, any kind of minority. Um, and so what do we have in our kind of current VRA regime? Well, here's Mississippi today. And you can see that that Delta region is more intact. Um, and consequently, the population of Mississippi is, is uh, cut this way into the districts producing these um, four representatives actually until recently. I think this is a little out of date. Um, okay, so what might we say about this? We might say that um, the VRA here is protecting electoral opportunity for African-Americans, but some legal scholars looking at it with a critical race lens have asked whether in the 21st century, this is premised on some essentializing narratives about, about race. Um, and so part of what I wanna ask us to think about is looking forward, especially in a climate at which in this new Supreme Court, uh, the VRA is very much under threat. What might it look like to reimagine um, a, a VRA for, for the 21st century? So what are some of these conditions today that I think um, make it possible to ask this question in exciting and provocative ways? Well, one, one piece of the puzzle is what's sometimes called conjoined polarization. Um, so we also heard um, from, from Karen Lips about a partisan narrative and, and maybe um, the, the question about whether we can move away from it. And then I think we also heard from uh, Professor Nye about some of the reasons that uh, polarization is a really important, uh, maybe more important than ever um, to understand patterns in our, um, in our representation. Um, conjoinment here means that um, race has become more predictive of party preference at this time um, than, than maybe at any other time uh, in, in our recent history. And that's part of the picture when we wanna understand the, the, the landscape and the playing field. But a new intersectional and coalitional way of thinking about representation um, is also emerging um, and, uh, and it has the opportunity to be written into the way that we, um, that we work around um, voting rights for the future. So um, a question that I would raise as well is for blocks that are less spatial than the situation that was faced in 1965 with the franchise, how might we think about new alignments? And so I'll just close with this image um, from 2018 when Pennsylvania redrew its, its lines. Um, so you see here a whole number of different ways that you can cut Pennsylvania up into 18 pieces. That was all scrambled when the lines were redrawn. So um, here's Pennsylvania's representation. It's actually the largest all male congressional delegation before the lines were redrawn. And then when those lines moved, um, and the court appointed an outside expert to redraw them, there was a significant realignment. So I'm showing you here by uh, the sides of the screen, the parties, um, but I hope you're noticing that there's also a demographic shift. Um, I've jokingly called it the year of the blonde woman. Um, okay, so um, some of the question that I want us to ask ourselves is how do different kinds of systemic realignment change um, the demographic opportunities and change the sort of um, the descriptive uh, and the substantive representation that we receive. Okay, so um, I'll just say that these questions ask us to think about our coalitions in terms that move away, um, you know, move not only past race and party, but into other kinds of alignments and issue alignments. Um, and so, you know, we have an opportunity to think about new voting systems for a new millennium. Um, for example, um, alternative voting systems such as uh, ranked choice and other kinds of um, social choice structures might give us a way to, uh, to, to move the conversation forward. Um, thank you so much. And now it's my pleasure to pass the virtual floor to Olivia Perez-Cubas. Thank you, Moon. And thank you to uh, the Radcliffe Institute for asking me to join this discussion today. I actually joined a separate panel with Harvard several weeks ago prior to the election. 
And my comments at the time really focused on how efforts on the right to support and elect more women lagged behind efforts on the left. Two years ago in 2018, Republicans elected just one new woman to that US House of Representatives. Meanwhile, as Democrats elected a wave of women to Congress, 2018 became known as the year of the woman and rightfully these women were applauded and they were celebrated, but too many qualified Republican women watched from the sidelines. So the results of the election just two years ago in large part um, are why groups like Winning for Women Action Fund were created. Winning for Women Action Fund is the first Republican super PAC dedicated solely to electing women. We wanted to make sure that Republican women had the support and resources that they needed to win and to match and go toe to toe with their peers on the left. We've seen for decades how women on the left had kind of this institutional support through organizations like Emily's List and that lacked on the right. So in just two years, the Republican party made significant gains this past election as has been previously stated. At least 36 Republican women will take seats in Congress next year. That is more than ever in American history. And at least 15 new Republican women were elected to the House, which is a far cry from the lone woman elected just two years ago. So while we still have ways to go, these are significant strides and they weren't by accident. So I'd like to briefly just touch on why I think Republicans made such significant progress, what they changed um, within the party and the political ecosystem and what that might mean in elections to come. What we saw this past year was a Republican party that vowed to make change following the midterm elections two years ago. It sparked a movement led largely by women like Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, by Susan Brooks from Indiana who led recruitment efforts this cycle and groups like Winning for Women were launched. As a result of all these efforts, more Republican women than ever before will be in Congress. And I think it's also important to note just how diverse many of these women are too. In Miami and South Florida, you have Maria Elvira Salazar, a Cuban American whose parents fled a communist Cuban regime. In New York, Nicole Maliotakis won her election. She's also Cuban American. In Oklahoma, you have Stephanie Bice, who's the first Iranian American to serve in Congress also a woman. In California, Young Kim and Michelle Steele will be among the first Korean Americans to serve in Congress. And in Indiana, you have a unique story there with Victoria Spartz, who grew up in Ukraine, moved to America as a young adult, and is now a member or will soon be a member of Congress. So it's a double win in many ways. So while we elected more women, we also elected women who come from all walks of life in this country. Um, and looking forward though, I think it's important to recognize the gains that we made this cycle, but obviously we have ways to go. Um, we are still outnumbered on the left and um, you know, we wanna make sure that we continue to grow upon these gains in future cycles. And electing women is just one part of the equation. As we all are familiar with, the Republican party has struggled appealing to some women, particularly suburban women. But we've found that one of the best ways to appeal to more women voters is by electing more women and ensuring that Republicans are giving women a seat at the table. Research shows, recent research shows that three out of four Republicans believe having more female candidates would help win over more female voters and help close that gender gap that we've seen within the Republican party. The majority of Republicans polled also said that having more Republican women in office helps ensure more women are appropriately represented. So we believe that success among women, both candidates and voters is critical to diversity, but also to the long-term survival of the Republican party. And there's no easier or better way to make gains on both fronts than by electing more qualified women. Ultimately, we at Winning for Women Action Fund believe that having more women at the helm of politics and conservative politics is good for both the Republican Party, but also for the country, and making sure that everyone has a voice and a seat at the table, women included. So I'll close similarly to how I closed my comments for the first panel, because while we've made incredible gains, there's still work to do. And at the end of the day, we want to diversify the party, we want to broaden the tent, we want to grow our appeal. The demand for women to be in leadership positions across the political spectrum will only 
continue to grow, especially as younger generations continue to define the direction of this country and shape new expectations of their government and of their leaders. We wanna make sure that we are a part of that conversation. So while 2020 is a great start, it's also just the beginning. Um, so with that, I will pass the virtual microphone to Ensei Ufat. Hello, hi, hello everyone. Um, I'm Ensei Ufat uh, of the New Georgia Project. We are a nonpartisan um, civic engagement organization. So uh, we are a 501c3 nonpartisan effort um, to educate and register Georgians to vote, particularly young people, uh, women and femmes, uh, particularly unmarried women and femmes and people of color. Uh, Georgia has 159 counties, the second highest number of counties in any state, second only to Texas, which has 30 million people, more people live in Texas than in Canada. Um, uh, but what that also means is that there are 159 kings and queens of elections who fall all along the ideological spectrum. Uh, and it makes the work of expanding Georgia's electorate and registering people to vote extraordinarily difficult, um, which is why I'm super proud of the work that we have done that has netted uh, an additional 500,000 young people and people of color uh, and added them to Georgia's voter roles. Um, how we do what we do. Uh, so just the basics of this is just in the year 2020. Uh, uh, the New Georgia Project, we were founded in 2013, but our large scale voter registration efforts did not begin until 2014. So what that looks like is 66 strategic partnerships. And what that means is um, we've built a network already of about 1,100 churches, synagogues, and mosques um, around the state of Georgia to do the work that we do. Um, so we've trained at least one faith leader and one lay leader in 1,100 congregations uh, and communities of faith around the state of Georgia. And so even in the middle of a pandemic, where we have been quarantined essentially since um, March 9th. We brought on 66 new community organizations, but mostly faith organizations um, around the state. Uh, this number needs to be updated, but um, we, were, we registered an additional 13,000 young people this year, again, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, you know, we had some bold, ambitious voter registration goals for 2020 um, and were uh, halted um, when we, uh, you know, in, in an attempt to save ourselves and save our lives. Uh, the work of the New Georgia Project actually happens with about 6,000 unique volunteers who've worked at least two shifts with us. Um, 2,100 dues paying members uh, in 2020. Uh, we reached out, our total outreach 4.39 million Georgians um, with uh, having sort of meaningful conversations with a quarter of a million young people and people of color uh, in our state. And this is all just to register people to vote. In the aftermath of the Shelby versus Holder Supreme Court decision where the the teeth essentially were kicked out of the voting rights act that we do this work behind for all intents and purposes enemy lines that you would think that a, civil, a new millennium civil rights organization run by gen zers and millennials uh that folks would welcome uh, the work that we do. Uh, and in fact, it is quite the opposite. Uh, you know, a mere 72 hours ago, uh, we learned that uh, uh, what we jokingly referred to as Republican fan fiction has now resulted in a, an investigation, a criminal investigation into the work of the New Georgia Project. Uh, the claim being that uh, our work doesn't exclusively focus on Georgians, that the New Georgia Project seeks to register uh, out of state uh, folks to vote in the 2021 20, um, runoff election as 
for many of you know on this call that there are two United States Senate runoff elections um, that Georgians will be going back to the polls to vote on again. And um, while we're super proud of the work that we're doing, um, that we've already done, we know that our work uh, must continue. Um, we know that there are 23,000 Georgians who have turned 18 between the November 3rd uh, general election and the January 5th runoffs. And we seek to register them all to vote. Um, and so this Monday, we learned that we were under investigation. Uh, the previous Monday, our Secretary of State had an emergency uh, elect state election board meeting to propose some additional rules, uh, one of them being uh, that any Georgian that registers to vote after November 3rd and attempts to vote by mail, um, that their ballots will be segregated from the rest of the ballots that uh, were submitted and subject to additional scrutiny. Um, and so anyway, I bring all of this up to let you know that again, this is the work uh, that it takes in a place like Georgia in order to, you know, flip the state is one way that I've heard it be described. Um, but, uh, you know, we had a very, very close election. So of the 5 million people that voted in Georgia's elections this November, um, the margin between the successful candidate, Vice uh, President-elect Biden uh, and President Trump, the margin was 13,000 votes. Uh, as we speak, they are certifying uh, the third recount uh, at Georgia. Georgia voters expense or actually Georgia taxpayers expense and it will once again confirm that the margin is around 13,000 votes. Now before 2020 we would have been concerned about um, uh, whether or not the integrity of the elections or whether or not the will of the voters was reflected in the results of the elections. And quite frankly, that is still very much a concern of ours. And in addition to, so what you should know is that these 6,000 active volunteers plus our 200 staff are required. Uh, we have had eyes on every step of the voter registration um, of the elections process. So beginning from voter registration going all the way until the counting of the ballot. And that is the amount of labor, that is the amount of oversight that still is required to make sure that people are eligible to vote and that they are allowed to vote without interference 100 years after the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> We've done a lot of celebratory uh, videos, uh, congratulatory videos, but uh, the thing that is absolutely clear to us is that um, there's always been a gap between the rhetoric um, of our democracy and how we talk about our elections and who participates and the reality of our democracy. And we see our work as trying to close the gap between the rhetoric and the reality. And the truth of the matter is that your race and gender uh, are by far the things that determine um, how you experience uh, democratic participation in Georgia's elections, even in 2020. Um, and so this is just a little, um, again, summary of all of the work that we do uh, in the middle of a pandemic after extraordinary, um, long, meaningful conversations with public health experts and OSHA experts, um, our board, our staff, our volunteers, we made the decision to go back on the door. So while campaigns and and we respect everyone's right uh, to campaign how it makes sense to them. We, uh, again, uh, with PPE and prayers and physical distancing, knocked on you know, uh, over 400,000 doors of young Georgians and Georgians of color. And so this work, um, and so you know, I, I will stop here. Um, 
but I, I, I think that it's extraordinarily important um, for people to sort of know and understand that uh, we still are very much um, at a place where, uh, it, you know, while we're celebrating 100 years of, um, and let's be honest, 100 years of white women securing the right to vote, I also think that that's really important to flag um, because we know that it took an additional 45 years of organizing to secure the right to vote for Black women um, and other women of color in our country. And so again, um, we, you know, join every everyone in acknowledging and celebrating um, the centennial of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And we also live a reality uh, that lets us know that there is so, so much work uh, that remains, that needs to get done uh, in order to uh, make sure that there's universal suffrage and that all eligible Americans have unfettered access to the ballot. And I will kick it to Leah Wright Rigger. Okay, so thank you so much for that. And thank you everyone for still tuning in virtually. Thank you to all of our panelists for their incredible ideas. What I'm gonna try and do now very quickly, very, very quickly, is really sum up some of the common themes that I think are important. And then I'm gonna kick it over to very brief questions before opening it up to audience Q&A. Um, and in fact, given the time limits, I may even constrain some of the questions that I have for the panelists even more. But I wanna start off by thinking about this quote by from, uh, from Fannie Lou Hamer of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. She gives this speech in 1964. And it's important to think about because she's both deeply critical of democracy, but hopeful for using this idea of political protest to push for a more just society, particularly alternative methods um, uh, for uplifting and changing democracy. And she says, not only do we need a change in the state of Mississippi, but we need a change here in Harlem. It's time for every American citizen to wake up because now the whole world is looking at this American society. Now quit saying that we are free in America when I know we're not free. You're not free in Harlem. The people are not free in Chicago. They're not free in Philadelphia. And when you get all the way through it and around it, some of these places are simply Mississippi in disguise and we want change. Now, I think this quote does a lot of heavy lifting for me in particular, because in running through these themes today, it actually, this kind of quote really unfolds the concept of democracy and the significance of democracy to this idea of the American Republic. But more importantly, not only does it really explode this idea of how we think about the 19th Amendment and the right to vote, um, particularly as we think of somebody like Hamer, who nearly died in her effort to secure the franchise for Black men and women in the 1960s, but I also think about the way in which Hammer was actually excluded from the very concept of the 19th Amendment and from democracy, while also fighting for those very same ideals in her decision to pursue democracy by an undemocratic regime, right? So there's a lot of work going on here. And so while each of our presenters has offered different ideas today, very different, very different ideas, I think a common theme that runs through these ideas is fundamentally about exploding the idea of the 19th Amendment alongside democracy as envisioned versus democracy in practice. So that's what I really wanna focus on uh, for our remaining time. What's particularly important here about these big ideas is that they really capture the significance of this broader concept of the 19th Amendment and the disparate ways that it affected things like voting, affects things like voting rights, citizenship, and democracy in the present. And so with that, I'd like to highlight essentially four big themes that I think our, our presenters talked about. The first is the concept of democracy, right? And expanding the franchise, expanding rights, but also expanding opportunity. And they thought about this in very different ways. I also want us to think about this moment of extreme polarization and essentially what amounts to the constriction of rights. Again, almost all of our panelists talked about this, but they talked about it in different ways. And I want us to think about what this extreme polarization and constriction of rights actually means for democracy, particularly through the lens of gender. The next thing that I wanna think about that I wanna highlight in terms of themes is the idea of gender as the backbone of democracy. Again, all of our panelists touched on this in some way or the other, and I really wanna bring that up and highlight that during the Q&A part of things. And then finally, actually Moon brought this up explicitly in her comments, 
but all of our panelists talked about rethinking networks and systems of power and the notion of women and the vote, right? The actual tangible vote as part of rethinking those networks and systems of power. So here, what I'd like to do is turn it over to each of our panelists. And I'm just gonna ask a question. And I, I ask that you, you know, keep your remarks as brief as possible, just so that we can jump into the Q&A. But I'm gonna start us off, I'd like to start us off by the, uh, uh, posing a question to May, who was our first speaker. Now, May, you said that, you know, at one point you said, ask the provocative question. I thought this was such a kind of juicy question. Does the vote even matter? Um, and you point to kind of these ideas of anti-democratic trends that we've seen in both the past and in the present. But I wanna flip the question back to you and think about how does the vote matter, particularly for racial minorities and women? And particularly as we think about the role that power that you outlined at the beginning of your conversation, uh, your beginning of your presentation, and thinking about the role and power of women in this election cycle. I mean, at one point you, you essentially said that women decided this election. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, particularly within the context of gender and the vote. Okay, thank you, Leah. Um, well, I would say that uh, first, the vote, I think, um, and this is something that's come out throughout this conference over the various panels, the vote is um, not the end all or be all of democracy. Um, the vote alone does not uh, guarantee democracy. It does not alone further democracy. And democratic inclusion uh, has been fought for uh, in many different realms, right? On the street, in organizations, um, through, uh, econo through the e economic sphere, etc. But the vote remains, I think, fundamental to a democracy. And without the vote, all those other things become more difficult. And I think for uh, those people who cynically say the vote doesn't matter, if it doesn't matter, then I don't know why so many people have fought so hard to keep it from so many other people, right? I think the vote really does matter. Now, with regard to the other part of your question or, or, or comment, I think, you know, there's a kind of funny moment we're in where questions of identity are, are actually really hard to parse. And, and, and pose a lot of challenges for us, right? So identities in terms of um, people belonging to ascriptive groups like women or African-Americans, uh, et cetera, um, have always mattered insofar as people's rights have been denied on grounds of their identity. On the other hand, people's identities don't People, you know, within those groups, people people are not homogenous blocks, right? Women uh, are not all of one mind. Um, some people were shocked that people of color voted for Donald Trump, but there's always been a conservative element in communities of color, always. There's always been 15% of black people who are Republicans and, uh, in, and more in Latino and Asian communities, although those communities of color have never been majority Republican at least in our era, right? And the same goes with women, you know, as, as we have heard from our conservative speakers, conservative women ran for Congress and some of them won. I mean, I don't know what I have in common with a woman in Congress who subscribes to QAnon theories. I don't know if I have an identity with her as another woman that, that overrides that ideological difference. So I think we do have a real challenge and we think about identity and identity politics. And I mean that in a very, very broad sense. I think, you know, um, uh, our communities uh, are, uh, and by gender, we're not all of one mind and that's not a bad thing at all. On the other hand, much of the suppression of votes uh, from gerrymandering to uh, what we see going on today it is very much racialized. Um, and that is very much a problem, I think. And, um, and I don't know if, I don't know, if, just one last point. I don't know if I would agree that um, women made the big difference in this election. I think uh, black people made the difference in this election. Thank you for that. Um, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Karen. Um, I have a question for Karen. Um, and I'm thinking about this idea of opportunity feminism that you put out there as part of your big ideas. 
Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how that works. I think it, it, it's a concept that we can kind of embrace as we think about feminism writ large, this kind of big opportunistic idea of feminism. But I also, it also strikes me that it may run into the same problem that mainstream femi feminism has historically run into, which is that it you know, unintentionally ends up disproportionately excluding marginalized community, marginalized figures. So in this case, black women, poor women, LGBTQI women, et cetera, et cetera. And so not only that, I think the divisions that we end up seeing um, are, are very real divisions that have material impacts on people's lives. So I was just wondering if maybe you could talk us through or help us work us through quickly how you solve for something like that, particularly uh, for women on the ground that currently believe that political institutions, right, the mainstream American two-party system is out of step with their day-to-day -day needs. Thank you for your question um, on, on opportunity feminism. Um, I started with education reform because I think that's where we can help people across the political spectrum, across um, socioeconomic classes and help the most um, number of people. So I feel like that's an issue that can help the poorest among us and really benefit all Americans. Um, again, I've tried to come at this in a unifying tone from a unifying aspect. So I think that's one issue we could address. Another issue um, that I'd love to talk about for just for a minute is occupational licensing reform. Um, we've seen that hit various communities inc in including African-American hair braiders where there are high costs, um, there are hours requirements to get licensing. So back in 1950, only 5% of professions were covered by occup occupational licensing laws. Now we're at over 50%. And a lot of times these seem to be in place less to protect public safety and health, but more in place as barriers to entry and as anti-competitive me measures. So again, I think that there's a number of areas where we can talk about how policy changes will impact all women. Thank you for that, Karen. So now I'm just gonna turn it over to Moon um, and just ask a, a quick question. I think I, I would love for you to expand on some of the concepts that you talked about in your big idea presentation, but particularly this idea that, you know, the Voting Rights Act practice is essentializing and then also how can alternative voting be more coalition, but particularly through with, within this idea of gender. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, thanks. So, um, so I loved too that you used um, the Fannie Lou Hamer quote that, that says, you know, maybe every place is Mississippi in disguise. Um, I, I promise we didn't plan that, but that worked so well with my like discussion of Mississippi then and now. Um, um, so I, I wanna expand on that a little bit. So what might it mean that that current Mississippi map that you saw, that four district Mississippi map, in what way might that be essentializing? Um, okay, so Mississippi today is something like 38% black, or that was true in the last census, um, and making it the highest percentage of, of uh, black residents of any state today. Um, and Mississippi has four districts. So um, you might wonder kind of in a, in a regime that's more proportional, how many of those would be black, either black controlled districts or black influence districts. Um, the VRA practice today, and here I'm following what um, my friend and very respected legal scholar, Justin Lovett has called a kind of cartoon practice of the, of the VRA today. Um, the, the idea that you might need to hit demographic benchmark targets in different districts in order to have them perform under the, uh, you know, by the lights of the Voting Rights Act. And you, you can see the way that looks in the map I showed you in today's Mississippi. You have one district dialed up over 60% black um, and, and the others with depressed percentages because redistricting is the ultimate fixed sum game. You only have so many people and the question is kind of how you divide them up. So what that means is that the government is preordaining in a way which districts should perform for which groups Right, and that's the essentializing um, practice that I was that I was referring to in um, very multiracial states like Texas, with as Ensay said, the most counties in, of, of any state in the union, um, and and a really complicated and interesting multiracial electoral history. In Texas, what that means is thinking about which congressional districts should perform for Black voters and which ones should perform for Latino voters, um, and in a sense, we we. Um, we like that the government has to safeguard opportunity to elect, 
but it might trouble us that that's done in this kind of very preordained fashion through demographics, right? And so what's the more coalitional alternative? So here I'm picking up on an idea that was very influentially promoted, for example, by Lonnie Guineer in the 1980s and 90s um, of alternative voting systems such as ranking your, your choices. Um, and when you rank your choices to elect multiple members from a single body, when you think about that, uh, that allows you to have a preference and a next preference and a next preference. And there's that coalitional piece coming together. Um, and a lot of research, including work coming out of uh, my lab is, is showing that what that does is that promotes this kind of intersectional and issue driven and somewhat less identitarian um, pattern of, of um, expression. Because after all, votes are many things, but one of the things that they are is a form of expression. Um, okay, so thanks for the opportunity to clarify that. Okay, all right, thanks. So I'm gonna actually move it over to a quick question for Olivia, and this actually segues into some of the questions that we're getting from the Q&A and we're getting from the audience. Um, and I was really interested in this idea. So you've had enormous amount of success. I, I think we've, we've heard this multiple times from this idea of women running for Congress, but also we're seeing an enormous amount of success for Republican women. And I think you used the phrase kind of diverse. But I think one of the things that we've seen, and you kind of hinted at this in your remarks, is that we've actually not seen the level of success that these women overall are experiencing amongst all representations of women. So for example, 14 black Republican women ran for Congress you know, uh, this year and all of them lost and they lost pretty spectacularly. And so I'm wondering, in, you know, and there are reasons for them losing in this way, but I'm wondering if you can explain, explain a little bit more about you know, your thoughts on these kind of loss and fissures, but also what are the necessary steps in order to rectify this kind of, you know, this kind of disparity? Sure, and thank you, thank you for the question. Um, before I answer directly, I do want to say, in large part, I think the number, the historic number of Republican women that we saw run this cycle was due to the success that women on the left had in 2018. And I think in a lot of ways, it inspired more Republican women to run in kind of this, if they can do it, we can do it mentality. And as I mentioned, we recognized a need that the Republican political ecosystem lacked the mechanisms in place that the left has. So we're proud of, of what we've done, but to, to your question, change, big change doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen in one single election cycle. I think a lot of the, the women of color who ran this cycle ran in, in very blue seats. Um, so it was gonna be hard for a Republican to win regardless, but winning for Women Action Fund, one of the ways that we feel we can be most effective is A, on the front end, trying to help recruit uh, Republican women who represent the spectrum of diversity, come from all walks of life, tapping into all corners of the party, similar to what the left does, and making sure that we are putting forward candidates who have, have a real shot. And then once they do decide to run, supporting them and making sure that they are getting their message out there, that voters know what they stand for, what they're running on, why they are running for Congress, and helping to the extent that we can push that out there, which I do think will come, um, will, will be extremely beneficial in the long run. And it's my hope that the gains that we had this cycle among Republican women will inspire even more women across the political spectrum to run in future years. Thank you for that. And so my last directed question uh, before we open it up to the Q&A is for Ense. And I, I, you know, I love that quote that you, you closed out with where you said, you know, there's a gap between the rhetoric and reality of our democracy, right? And like that has so many implications for what we're talking about both at this conference, but also a larger kind of electoral trends that we're seeing in political trends. And I was wondering if you could kind of expand on something that you hinted at, but didn't necessarily uh, get a chance to delve into, which is this idea of, I think, disinformation and misinformation, particularly disinformation that is kind of nuanced and is being targeted in particular at black voters, especially black men in really interesting and I think um, alarming ways. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that uh, as we go forward. Yes, okay, I will. Uh, we spend an extraordinary amount of time thinking about this and organizing around this and 
it is definitely not a, a simple answer, uh, but I will do this. So I think that oftentimes when people think about um, disinformation, um, as it relates to elections, right? Like some of the easy examples that we think of are, you know, <clears throat> robocalls in years past that will target black voters and give them the wrong election day, right? Um, and while we still see some of those tactics, um, what we are now experiencing and contending with is actually much more sophisticated. Um, you know, if you don't believe me or any of our colleagues or comrades, uh, I'm assuming that people will believe the Mueller report um, and the FBI uh, that tells us that um, Black voters are the number one targets for misinformation and disinformation by bad actors, both foreign and domestic. In 2016, um, you know, thinking about the, the the Black Lives Matter, the largest Black Lives Matter Facebook group uh, was actually stood up and and staffed uh, by Russian operatives. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of those tactics, I don't think that uh, those of us who are defenders of democracy, those of us who run campaigns, um, have not actually learned our lessons from elections past particularly 2016, um, and that we saw an even more aggressive use of disinformation and misinformation targeting voters. Um, examples that we have are, um, you know, from all the way up to the President of the United States and their press secretary uh, on an aggressive campaign this summer um, to say that vote by mail and absentee ballots are not the same thing, and that um, what we've seen because of this pandemic and because of quarantine has been an explosion in the use of vote by mail because, quite frankly, it's one of the safest ways to participate in our elections. Safe in terms of managing your exposure to coronavirus, but safe in terms of having a paper trail. In a state like Georgia, where they bought 30,000 new voting machines and November, the November general election election was the first time that most Georgians would be able to use it and have access to it. Um, and they don't have a paper trail. So there's a, so auditing the elections becomes much, much more difficult. Uh, and so telling, uh, so, so we saw a, a, a spike in the use of vote by mail. And so having the president of the United States and their press secretary and other surrogates for him try to discourage the use of votes, vote by mail by saying, if you are not, at, if you are voting from home, that vote by mail is only for people who will be out of their jurisdiction. We know that that's not true in most states. Um, and that is the kind of disinformation that we have to combat, that it feels benign on its face, but it actually has an impact on how people participate in our elections. Or, you know, seeing things like putting up billboards in Black communities and in rural communities saying voter fraud carries with it a penalty of up to 10 years in prison and a hundred thousand dollars in fine so like make sure that you aren't caught voter fraud or um and the thing is uh our Secretary of State has refused to put out clear guidance for formerly incarcerated people who have uh, who have regained the franchise, who have regained their right to vote. So there's an extraordinary amount of confusion and they refuse to provide any additional guidance. And many people are afraid of reoffending because as you know, in Georgia, or maybe you don't know, but if you are, uh, convicted of a felony, um, once you satisfy the terms of your sentence, you are allowed uh, automatically to register to vote. But the de defining what satisfying the term of your sentence means um, is something that we literally have been battling with the Secretary of State. Uh, the one that is currently our governor and the current secretary of state. Um, and, and they 
want it that way um, because it depresses participation. It makes people nervous. It makes people concerned again about possibly reoffending, um, and it very much has an impact on who participates in our elections, and it is a problem. So thank you for that. So um, we have a lot of questions and what I'm going to try and do, particularly for the sake of time and so that we can get everybody into this conversation, I'm going to try and combine some of the questions and then parcel them out to the conversation, uh, to, the, uh, to the group based on some of the themes that we saw. So I think the first one, the first bigger, big question is thinking about some of these ideas around polarization and partisanship. And I wanna direct this to Olivia and to Moon and because I think they'll give us good insight into to kind of some of these ideas. And so the larger question is really thinking about, you know, we've had these, this historic election, we've had a historic number of women elected to Congress, a historic number of Republican women elected to the Congress, but I'm wondering if that's enough. Certainly it is out of whack perhaps with ideas that are circulating around what it perhaps means in terms of representation, whether it be partisan representation or otherwise. So I'm wondering, and one of the, the panelists says, one of the questions that says, it phrased it as, you know, would having, is having a seat at the table enough? And I would add on to that, is it enough, particularly when, you know, the larger infrastructure of, you know, in this case, the Republican Party, but also the Democratic Party, may be out of step with the kind of congressional women that are being elected in this case. So Moon and Olivia, I would love you guys to weigh in on this. Um, Olivia, do you wanna start? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the biggest, having a seat at the table is not the first step. Um, I think first deciding, and this is coming from my area of expertise, first deciding to run is a huge step getting women, Republican women to run um, was a challenge in, for many cycles in the past. And we always, you know, now we can kind of joke that where you had to ask a woman to run multiple times and almost convince her to run, you almost had to convince men not to run in certain <laughs> instances. Um, so, so first running, being successful in their campaign, and then earning a seat at the table, and then kind of what you do once you have that seat at the table. And one of the things that I have found to be a common theme is women more often than not tend to be more bipartisan. They tend to reach across the aisle more often than, than their counterparts. And obviously this country is in a very decisive place where it's hard to have civil discourse and whatnot. And it's my hope going forward that having more women across the political spectrum as it relates to me, more Republican women helps kind of put push and advance the dialogue forward and actually gets things done in Congress and starts kind of mending the divide that we're seeing. Um, thanks, yeah. Let me say a bit about um, my thoughts on that question. So I kind of alluded to this before, but I think if it, that you're getting at the distinction between what people have called descriptive representation and substantive or other terms have been used for this. And, and basically the question is, does electing someone who in some sense is like you, is that a proxy for your interests? Right. In, a, in a way, that's the question. That's an old question in, in political theory, of course. Um, but it, it, you know, it takes on a new flavor every decade, every generation, as we as we rethink what it what it is to to sort of build a body that looks like us in some way, and and then think about how that body might act. Um, I, I think for me, one of the frontiers that I really look at closely is um, is local elections. I, I really part part of the reason for that is I mean absolutely as someone who thinks about redistricting, I, I think about Congress and congressional districts all the time. Um, but we're a little more constrained in our options about how to elect for Congress than we are uh, in local elections. Um, we we must uh, right now by law elect um, members of Congress out of, uh, of up to the House out of single member districts, every district elects one person. So if you look for instance at Maine, which recently moved to, to ranked choice voting, um, for Congress, it still does that district by district. So you can rank your choices, but it's you know not for the whole state, but within each district one by one. Whereas you know, in the US we have these laboratories of democracy. We have, um, not only do we have 50 states, 
But actually, per the Census Bureau, we have 90,000 local governments in the US. And that's a staggering number. And so that's many different opportunities to try different things. Um, and I'm, I'm especially interested in some of those um, state level, but below the state level, county commissions, judicial elections, local elections, a lot of those down ballot races that really make up kind of the, the texture of, of, of local governance. And there, um, there's a lot of interesting work looking at this tension between um, descriptive and, and, and substantive. I'll give you just one quick example as a pointer to a place to look for some interesting work on this. Um, but but um, so one example is if you look at city councils, a, a lot of them elect at large. In other words, everybody votes, they vote for a certain number of people and the, the ones who get the most votes win. That's how most city councils elect. Um, and that's, you know, that's been called the most racist system of all because it's a system that makes it possible for the barest majority to block vote and lock out any influence for even a sizable minority. Um, and as those are overturned, usually civil rights organizations look to single member districts. You know, that's what the Voting Rights Act history kind of tells us is the go-to remedy. But, you know, I was just reading today an interesting project by um, political scientist named uh, Vlad Kogan who's looking at ways that, for instance, districted um, elections might lead to making it harder to, for, to, um, to adopt affordable housing reform because districted elections promote um, kind of city councils that you might um, call more NIMBY oriented, not in my backyard, right? So when you have, it, it's a really interesting interplay between what's really local um, and the kind of policies that are enacted. And I think there's a lot of interesting work happening on this right now that's looking at the relationship between systems, how we elect, people, who we elect, uh, and policy, what they do, right? Um, so that's, that's sort of a non-answer, but I think it's the right answer, <laughs> um, is, that, is that this is a really active and interesting area of research. So we're um, we're getting close to to a couple of the last questions. So I, I want to make sure that we ever get everyone in here. And I know May, you wanted to jump in very quickly about something with regard to this idea of a seat at the table. So please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I think it's, I, I just want to say something very quickly, which is I think something that um, one difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is the Democratic Party um, is a big tent party, and there's a lot of arguing and, and fighting that goes on sometimes publicly over what positions, you know, the Democrats should push for. I don't know, what is it, I'd like to know from uh, my Republican colleagues, what does it mean for Republican women to have a seat at the table when the Republican Party in Congress votes pretty much in lockstep as their leadership tells them to? Um, you know, they, they may be a diverse group. Um, that's not what I want to debate here. But what does it mean to have a seat at the table when Mitch McConnell and, and the House House uh, Minority Leader tells people how to vote and there's hell to pay if you don't do that? So I, I have a question here for um, actually for Karen and for Ense. Um, and I think it's it's one that, you know, I'm going to add on a little bit, a little bit of spice to it <laughs> as well. So in a conversation with Jeff Blake at the Kennedy School a couple of years ago, um, I said one of the signs of a healthy democracy is that we have really, really high voter turnout. Now, the United States does not have high voter turnout, and this works in a, a number of ways, uh, both in terms of you know uh, non-voting specific non-voting groups, which can vary depending on the election cycle. And so we might say that the United States is not a healthy democracy. But the bigger question, I think, is, and again, I want to pose this to and say, and um, and to Karen, because I want to hear kind of different perspectives on this. Is you know, is more voting a good thing, right? Is it good for a healthy democracy, or you know, in the United States, given the peculiarity of the United States, is is you know, is less voting the goal? So, and say, and Karen, I can't imagine uh, saying that less voting 
is a sign of a healthy democracy at all. Uh, when I think about, you know, the decisions that are made uh, at the local, state, and federal government, how our how working people's tax dollars are spent, um, like the collective decisions that we make as a society, uh, voting, and I mean, I understand that we are a republic, so voting for people who essentially will co-govern with the with the people. Um, voting for people who are who not only know what their constituents priorities are but who feel accountable to them uh, and having less people choose them um, I, I I can't imagine a set of circumstances that 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 acknowledges that um, acknowledges a smaller electorate as being more democratic I imagine that you guys are some, y'all are super smart. Uh, and so <laughs> I look forward to like some examples, but I'm really struggling to, to conceive of a set of circumstances where a shrinking, a smaller electorate uh, means a more robust, more secure, more mature democracy. I'd say, yeah, so um, I'm, yeah. Karen, if you wanna jump in here. Yes, I'd say seeing activism by people with different views is a good thing because it signals that they all feel like they can work within the system, which is what we want, right? We were set up in a way um, so that different views could be uh, explored and advocated for, and then we would all hopefully come together um, at each election cycle, and then you know those battles could play out at the in the next election cycle. Um, but one thing I want to uh, mention that I think is a challenge we're facing right now is whether people feel comfortable speaking out or if they're self-censoring. I know I mentioned that a little bit in my initial remarks, um, but the Cato Institute recently came out with a poll showing that 77% of Republicans self-censor while only 52% of Democrats do, and that 58% of staunch liberals felt they didn't have to self-censor. They were the only group, a majority of whom didn't self-censor. And I think that's fascinating um, a fascinating topic for us to explore is why certain groups feel like they have to self-censor and could that be a problem down the road if some groups don't feel like their vote, vote matters or, or will make a difference. So I think that's something um, that we really should, should explore more. Okay. So I, I think I have a question that's for, I'd love all the panelists to weigh in on just very quickly because again, we're, we're tight on time. But I would love to hear, you know, there's a question in, there's a question that's being posed by someone in the audience about legislation, but specifically violence against women and things like that. But I actually want to make it a bit broader. Um, you know, one of the things that Americans fundamentally dislike about Congress in, is gridlock and the idea of gridlock. And I think particularly with the incoming Biden administration, there seems to be an opportunity for some kind of passage of really transformational legislation. So I'm wondering if our panelists could weigh in on just very quickly on what they think has the possibility of happening or getting done in Congress, particularly in the next two years. So if we could start off perhaps with May, that would be that would be terrific. Well, I think the Democrats have always been willing to negotiate and it's the Republican Party that um, has eschewed bipartisan bipartisanism and has been obstructionist uh, since the days of Newt Gingrich. So I'm a little disappointed that the questions I pose are studiously dodged and avoided or ignored by the other panelists. But I don't see any sign from the part on the part of the Republican leadership that they're willing to compromise on anything. So I think uh, depending on the outcome of the election in January uh, will make a big difference in terms of what this administration can achieve uh, in the Congress. OK, so we can jump to Moon. How about? Just to address the question that, that might be lingering, um, so, so May asked who won the election, and um, I think uh, it's pretty clear that, that, that uh, Biden won the election. Um, I also think <laughs> that one of the things that's fascinating, I actually, I think a fair bit about voting security, voting technology, and the different ways that we can um, not only ensure that um, elections are carried out in a way that we can have confidence in, but that, that kind of legitimacy might flow from not only the systems of election in the sense I was talking about earlier, like the, the way to convert votes into seats, but also the technological and technical systems of election. 
Um, that one of the things I like to think about is, is trust in, in that system. And so actually, I just want to take a moment to note one thing that I think is really interesting about the tumult that's happening right now with the question of election integrity. It's turning an eye on some of the mechanisms that you'd need to audit elections in a way that while it's happening very strangely, I think might ultimately be pretty healthy. Um, thinking about um, how voters can be sure that their vote is, is cast as intended and, and can kind of um, look, you know, for sort of from in the big picture of the process, look at, you know, mechanisms of, of trust. Um, elections are fundamentally about trust. Um, and I think that that as strange and um, democratically threatening as this moment is, um, that, that might be one good thing that comes out of it is, is looking closer at these machines and how they record our vote and how we, how we kind of can interact with our vote in, in, a, in a way that, that happens um, after the fact. This is a thought, you know, it's the, the question that, that May posed has been kind of hanging over this panel and I wanted to bring a little bit of attention back to it, focus on that and think about um, some of the ways that that might be um, informative. All right, um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna turn for the sake of time, I'm gonna turn it over to Nse. I, um, I say that uh, I also agree. Uh, and so do the, does the data support the assertion that Joe Biden uh, won the presidential election? Um, I would say the number one thing that I could see getting done uh, uh, with the next sort of Congress uh, is to pass the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act, the Voting Rights Restoration Act. Um, it is there, it is clear, it has been deliberated over a number of years, uh, and quite frankly, and hopefully, um, you know, with this new Senate um, that gets seated after the conclusion of Georgia's runoff elections on January 5th, that we might have a fighting chance uh, at restoring the Voting Rights Act uh, and restoring some faith and confidence in our democracy and our elections infrastructure. All right, so thank you for the insay. I'm gonna turn it over to Olivia, who I don't think we've heard from yet. Um, two things, one a little bit more symbolic, one more tangible, I think. Um, for the symbolic one, President-elect Biden has been talking much about unity. And I, this is certainly something I would like to see more of. I think having more women in Congress gets us a little bit closer to that. Uh, more tangibly, I think having coronavirus relief is important. It's been obstructed mostly in the house. Um, and I hope that we can provide relief, particularly, particularly to our small businesses in the very near future because it is badly needed. Okay, thank you for that. And so Karen, you have our, our, closing, our closing comment. Yeah, I mean, I'd echo what Olivia um, just said, uh, mentioning coronavirus relief. I think that should be a top priority uh, of Congress and all of our leaders across the country because that's the issue that, that is really affecting so, so many people. And it looks like we've still got um, some months ahead of that for us. Okay, so we are just about out of time. I know there are lots more questions, uh, both from the staff at Radcliffe, but also from, uh, also from in the Q&A. And so what I would invite you to think about and what, uh, what I would really encourage you to do is to think of this as an invitation for the beginning of the conversation. What we wanted to do here today was kind of have a siloed conversation with each of these panelists about big ideas and big ideas that they were thinking about, particularly given their role in the Democratic Republic, kind of the Democratic Republic within the United States and the kind of things that they have been doing to advance right, these ideas around gender and the 19th Amendment, particularly in the last couple of years. So with that, I have to say thank you to the Radcliffe Institute and all of our sponsors for their sponsorship and support for this event. I also wanna thank Jane Kamensky, uh, Rebecca Wasserman, and Wendy Froelich for their work throughout this two year process, right? So this was a very, very long process to bring this to fruition. And then finally, I wanna thank each of our fantastic panelists for sharing their time and most importantly, their ideas with us. I hope this makes us all go forward and really think about the new ideas and new ground for the future of democracy and the impact of the 19th Amendment, women and gender in the United States. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jane. Thank you, Leah. And thank you for doing such a fabulous job of moderating this, uh, moderating this panel.
um, a, a difficult and needful conversation in a momentous turning point in the history of our Republic. I wanna thank all the speakers today. And I wanna thank also our wonderful event staff for coordinating these six events across the fall of 2020. Um, and you can find all of the videos and this one coming soon. Thanks to all in the audience also for coming. And finally, let me just take a moment to thank once again, the core group of colleagues whose intellect and energy have shaped the entire long 19th amendment project, which is very long indeed, um, from soup to nuts. And that is Corey Field of the University of Virginia, Lisa Tetro of Carnegie Mellon, and the historian Susan Ware, who has truly earned her 2020 title at Schlesinger Library as our honorary suffrage centennial historian. Finally, I also want to thank Marilyn Dunn, who has carried the nittiest and grittiest parts of the Long 19th Amendment project on the bridge called her back for four years, without whom nothing. Thank you all and to all a good night. <laughs>